The Invitational Minor Hockey Tournament in the Strait Richmond area has hosted hundreds of teams with players aged 5 to 18 competing in 11 divisions. And whereas the New Page Tournament brings more than 1,500 players, coaches and officials, along with their families to the area every year where they spend money at hotels, restaurants and other local businesses. And whereas numerous volunteers work diligently to make this tournament memorable for all participants and fans. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly send congratulations to the organizers of the New Page Invitational Tournament for the excellent work they do supporting minor hockey in Cape Breton and Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Amherst's Brad Blankhorn, having lost his right foot at the age of 18 months, has shown strength, dedication and perseverance in, be in becoming one of Canada's most talented amputee hockey players. And whereas Brad, now 29, has made the Canadian standing amputee hockey team for the second season in a row after returning with a gold medal from the World Championships in 2008. And whereas Brad is one of only two players east of Quebec who will travel to Montreal for the 2010 World Amputee Hockey Championships the week of April 26th in Montreal. Where the Canadian team will compete for its fifth consecutive gold medal and world title. Therefore, be it resolved that this House of Assembly congratulate Brad Blankhorn on his achievements thus far and wish him all, him and all the Canadian players, the best of luck in their quest for gold. Mr. Speaker, I will request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Clare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Clare Acadien Atom B hockey team participated in the, in the 33rd SEDMA International Minor Hockey Tournament in Dartmouth from March 31st to April 2nd, 2010, and whereas the team played against TASA in the Accord Division Final, and whereas the SEDMA International Hockey Tournament is one of the largest and most respected multi-level hockey tournaments in North America, therefore be resolved that members of this House of Assembly congratulate the Clare Acadien Atom B hockey team and their coaches for winning the Accord Division Final during the 33rd Annual SEDMA International Hockey Tournament. Mr. Speaker, I would ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Argyle. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the NDP made the bold campaign promise of ensuring that the Cobbequid Medical Centre would remain open 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the last provincial campaign. And whereas the Cobbequid Medical Centre closes at 10 p.m. and opens again at 7 a.m. And whereas last time I checked, that meant another NDP broken promise on health care made to the people of Sackville. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly demand the Minister of Health be honest with the people of Sackville and state that the ND prom, NDP promise of, uh, will never see the light of day on the Cobbequid Medical Centre, being 24 hours a day, seven days a week operation. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passes without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? I hear several no's. The uh, motion is tabled. The uh, Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on an introduction. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to draw the attention of the host to your gallery, the Speaker's Gallery, to uh, introduce uh, Wayne Adams, who is no stranger to this place. And uh, it's always a welcome. Uh, it's always we're always welcome to see you here, but especially on this day uh, when Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia government. Uh, corrected a wrong uh, and removed a mark off of our history. So, Wayne, it's always great to see you. Would you rise and receive a uh, form of We uh, welcome Mr. Uh, Adams here today, and of course we have uh, the opportunity to see his picture on the wall here every day of the legislature's open. So, uh, the uh, honourable member for Dartmouth East. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Wayne, you're always with us. Uh, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas on May 26, 1986, an act to establish the Shubenacadie Canal Commission received royal assent. And whereas the Act provides that the Commission, a body corporate for the province of Nova Scotia, is to oversee, promote and operate interpretive centres, canal lands, buildings and infrastructure on behalf of the people of Nova Scotia and the Government of Nova Scotia. And whereas the Commission began with an op annual operating grant of $186,000 a year, which was reduced by the John Hamm Government to $32,000 a year, a cut which has now been maintained by the NDP Government and does not cover the operating costs for the facilities it owns. Therefore, be it resolved that the House of Assembly recognize the value of the Shubenacadie Canal Commission and its supporters to the history and the continued economic development of Nova Scotia and request that it be funded to at least meet the ba basic operating costs of the land and facilities it manages on behalf of the provincial government. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver and pass There the has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? I hear several no's. The motion is tabled. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future date I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Nova Scotia business sector has repeatedly warned that economic growth will be hurt by the recent HST hike. And whereas progressive conservatives recognize the most, that the most vocal have been members of the small business sector, seen by many to be Nova Scotia's economic backbone, and whereas at an economic roundtable held last month by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, attendees warned that a tax hike will risk the health of the small business sector already dealing with rapidly rising costs during a period of economic recovery. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly demand this NDP government explain what, why it has turned its back on small businesses in Nova Scotia by increasing taxes after a campaign platform of political rhetoric and empty promises which assured Nova Scotians this would not take place. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? I hear several noes. The motion is tabled. The Honourable Member for Preston. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day to move the adoption of the following resolution. Where it's been confirmed that the Minister of Finance provided the Premier and Cabinet colleagues with a sizable income tax cut by eliminating the surtax on Nova Scotians, Nova Scotians making more than $83,000 per year. Whereas this NDP budget is plain, paying for the income tax cut by raising HST while providing no income tax relief for the majority of Nova Scotians forcing the middle class and working poor to pay for the Honourable Minister of Economic Development and Rural Development an income tax cut. Whereas this NDP government has clearly thrown the working poor and middle class in income earners of Nova Scotia under the Dexter bus, creating a bitter deal for today's families. Therefore, we resolve that all members of this House of Assembly implore the Minister of Economic and Rural Development to explain to the people of Nova Scotia and its constituents why he deserves an income tax cut by the middle class and working poor shoulder the burden of the government's ill-conceived tax regime and tax increases. I'd ask for waiver. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? I hear several noes. The motion is tabled. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Dick Lemon, a businessman from Five Islands, Colchester County, has become well known for his development of a retreat on the island known as Long, which is used by groups such as the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, King's College, Nova Scotia Symphony, and Mount Allison University, and Long Island being one of the five islands, Dick is also responsible for creating the Not Since Moses Run, which attracts over 1,000 runners who complete their run on the ocean's floor. He has opened Moe's Cafe, a book and art store, and a hostel. And whereas Dick has been presented with the Nova Scotia 2009 Innovator of the Year Award by the Tourism Industry of Nova Scotia, therefore be it resolved all members of the House of Assembly extend congratulations to Dick Lemon for receiving this prestigious, prestigious award for his many contributions to Nova Scotia's tourism industry. I request waiver of notice, passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. 
Whereas the Chicken Burger is a well-known landmark in Bedford and surrounding communities and reputed to be the oldest drive-in restaurant in Canada still in existence. And whereas Jack and Bernice Innes for many years ran the Chick and sold it in 2007 to well-known Halifax businessman Mickey McDonald, and whereas in March of this year the Chicken Burger celebrated 70 years in business as it has always done by serving the best milkshakes, chicken burgers and onion rings on the planet, therefore be it resolved that members of this house congratulate the Innes and McDonald families on pro providing an iconic food experience for the past 70 years and wish them well in their future endeavours. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future date I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Shedekamp native Warren Chesson has dedicated his life to music, beginning his formal musical training at age nine and has traveled the world sharing his musical talents. And whereas in Warren's distinguished career, he has released three albums and composed and played in over 1,700 Broadway performances. Whereas Warren's work has been critically received by the Trenton Times, the Duke Ellington Society, the AP, and the New York Times, even referred to him as one of the six top vibraphonists of the last half century. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly congratulate Warren Chesson on receiving such critical praise and wish him continued success in the future. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Digby, Annapolis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Digby Dashing Diamonds are a wonderful synchronized skating team from the Digby area. Whereas this team took home gold at both the Valley Open and the Provincial Championships earlier this year. And whereas the team manager summed up this season as an excellent and the skaters had good attitudes and had fun. Therefore, be it resolved, the members of the House of Assembly recognize team manager Lori Sabin, coach Cheryl Gaston, and the entire Digby Dash and Diamonds team for their outstanding accomplishments this year and wish them well in their future endeavor. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. <laughs> there has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favor say aye. All those against say nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future date I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Cape Breton University Chair of Marine Ecosystem Research and Director of the Bredore Institute, Bruce Hatcher, has been named to the Fisheries Resource Conservation Council of Canada. And whereas this council is currently looking into the state of the East Coast ground fisheries, looking into the conditions necessary to achieve and maintain a sustainable ground fishery, and whereas Cape Breton University will be able to translate this research into a significant contribution to policy and implementation. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly congratulate Mr. Hatcher on his recent appointment and wish him the best of luck with his work in this very important field of research. And Mr. Speaker, I would request notice, passage, waiver of notice and passage without debate. The uh, Honourable Member has asked for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Cape Breton South. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Minister of Agriculture and Natural Resources yesterday stated that when the younger member is an older member, he'll get his facts straight when referring to the member from Dartmouth East. And whereas such age discriminatory remarks at a time when this government is attempting to recruit and retain our younger people in this province is counterintuitive, and whereas younger people being involved in politics is a rarity in this day and age, and very few take the step to run for public office. Therefore, be it resolved that we all celebrate that a younger member from Dartmouth East sits in this house and is showing younger people that they have a place in Nova Scotia politics. I would ask for a waiver, Mr. Speaker. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? 
Are your several no's? The motion is tabled. The Honourable Member for Argyle. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas progressive conservatives believe Nova Scotians are innovative people who continue to excel on the global stage. Whereas an excellent example of this is Terry Hawkins Industries Limited, which uses gel coat to create large sheets of sign panels, largely from recycled material, which are purchased all over North America. And whereas Terry Hawkins Industries Limited was recognized for his excellent work by recently being nominated for a Manning Innovation Award, which is presented to Canadians who have developed and successfully marketed a concept which had both a social and, eco and economic impact. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly congratulate Terry Hawkins Industry Limited on this nomination, as well as continued success into the future. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver notice and passage of debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Atlantic Fashion Week is a highly respected and well-attended annual event that promotes the innovative local fashion industry, and whereas Halifax is currently hosting Atlantic Fashion Week's fourth season from April 14th to 18th, and whereas Atlantic Fashion Week 2010 enhances the profile of Nova Scotia's growing fashion industry by providing them a dynamic venue for top fashion designers from Atlantic Canada and particularly Nova Scotia by attracting buyers and creative investors from across the country. Therefore, be it resolved, the House of Assembly join me in congratulating the featured designers, organizers, and participants of Atlantic Fashion Week 2010 and wish them success in this endeavor. Mr. Speaker, ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future date I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Michael McDonald, a resident of Big Bedore, recently received a hype award honouring young professionals and entrepreneurs in Cape Breton. And whereas Michael is a successful small business owner operating Revive Hair Studio, and whereas Michael was awarded the Excellence in Business Development Award, recognizing his recent business growth and expansion, therefore be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly congratulate Michael McDonald on his recent achievements and much deserved recognition and wish him continued success. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Halifax businessman David Miller has, has applied his experience in business development and renewable energy to establish a new firm, firm, Form for Renewable Energy, and whereas the new venture will help Nova Scotian and Atlantic Canadian companies to access green business opportunities in the United States, and whereas Mr. Miller recognized the opportunity to connect Nova Scotian firms to the many opportunities in the expanding green economy, therefore be it resolved that the members of this House congratulate David Miller on the establishment of the Forum for Renewable renewable energy, which will assist Nova Scotian environmental companies to grow and thrive. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future date I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas in 2008, the Joggins Fossil Cliffs were designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. And whereas despite stagnant tourism numbers in Nova Scotia last year, the Joggins Fossil Cliffs Interpretive Centre saw its second straight year of increased visitors. And whereas the increased number of visitors to the Joggins Fossil Cliffs means more tourists in Cumberland County, therefore be resolved all members of this House of Assembly congratulate the Joggins Fossil Cliffs Interpretive Centre on a great year and wish them another successful season in 2010. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver notice and pass without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Kings West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas it has been confirmed that the Minister of Finance provide the Premier and Cabinet colleagues with a tax cut by eliminating the surtax 
on Nova Scotians making more than $83,000 per year. And whereas this NDP budget is paying for the income tax cut by raising the HST while providing no income relief to the majority of Nova Scotians, forcing the middle class and working poor to pay for the Honourable Minister of Finance's tax cut, and whereas this NDP government has clearly thrown the working poor and middle income earners of Nova Scotia under the Dexter bus, creating a bitter deal for today's families. Therefore, be it resolved that members of the House of Assembly implore the Honourable Minister of Finance to explain to the people of Nova Scotia and his constituents why he deserves the income tax cut while the middle class and working poor shoulder the burden of this government's ill-conceived tax regime. Mr. Speaker, that'll be fine. The motion is tabled. The uh, Honourable Member for Hans West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas volunteering is the practice of people working on behalf of others or a particular cause without payment for their time and services. And whereas volunteer Rick King of Hansport was recently awarded a certificate for Volunteer of the Year for his countless hours of dedication and contribution to his community. And whereas, Rick, and whereas spending his time as a member of the Volunteer Fire Department, the Hansports Lions Club, the HMCC Board of Directors, as well as spending time as a volunteer at the Hansports School, and maintaining an outdoor rink within his community. Rick has shown he truly deserves the Volunteer of the Year Award. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly congratulate Rick King on caring about others in his community and thank him wholeheartedly for making a difference. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the International Association of Administrative Professionals offers a designation of Certified Professional Secretary, and whereas the CPS designation certifies that an individual has a high level of knowledge and expertise in the administrative profession, having completed rigorous multi-part examinations in finance, business law, office technology, human resource management, administrative communications and management, and whereas Patricia Nichols of Halifax, who is the executive assistant to the headmistress at Sacred Heart School, has received the CPS designation, therefore be it resolved that members of this House of Assembly congratulate Ms. Nichols upon receiving her certified professional secretary rating and wish her well in her chosen career. Mr. Speaker, asks for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Digby, Annapolis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the wood biomass business seems to be on the agenda as a renewable green energy resource in the province, but is being disputed by some who fear that clear cutting will increase to supply future demands for electricity. And whereas in Western Nova Scotia a resource exists that could fill a huge portion of this future demand to supply our province with renewable energy and also make a lot of people very happy. Whereas this resource of alders that will grow four feet per year in Western Nova Scotia is a nuisance to the people and a great expense to the Department of Transport trying to keep them out of the highways and ditches. Therefore, be it resolved that the Minister of Transport work with the Minister of Energy in creating a plan to use these fast-growing trees for future energy supplies that will create a win-win-win situation for this entire province. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver. Okay, the, there is a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Clare. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Tourism Industry Association of Nova Scotia presented its 2009 Pineapple Awards, and whereas the pineapple has become the, tr the international symbol of hospitality and is widely displayed in residences and businesses to extend a warm welcome to visitors, and whereas the 2009 Pineapple Award was given to Billable Motors of Church Point by the Nova Scotia Tourism Industry. 
Therefore, it be resolved that members of this House of Assembly congratulate Billable Motors for receiving this award for outstanding personal service to the tourism industry in Nova Scotia and wish them continued success in future endeavours. Mr. Speaker, I would ask for waiver, notice, and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. No further notices of motion. Uh, we're soon going to be coming into question period, and I just want to uh, remind uh, members that uh, no electronic equipment to be on during uh, question period time. And secondly, um, all questions and answers are to be directed here through the chair. Now, the time is 2.25, and we'll go to uh, 3.25. Uh, I'll recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. My, my question is for the Premier. Because of the decision of his government to raise the HST, municipal, municipal governments have an even widening revenue gap. HRM is looking at a $2 million revenue shortfall. CBRM is close to, to $1.6 million. Smaller municipalities are facing an average of $25,000 in revenue shortfall thanks to the NDP HST hike. Towns and municipalities have to explore all options that are in front of them. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, have the towns of Pictou County approached you for assistance with an amalgamation study? The Honourable Premier. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, no, they have not. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on your first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, towns have asked the province for help to find the feasibility studies. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, those municipalities are telling us that they've asked this government for assistance on a feasibility study. Towns and municipalities are trying to deal with the problem that this NDP government has downloaded onto them. They're looking for solutions to the problems this government has put in front of them. So my question to the Premier, will you work with the towns in Pictou County to help them solve this problem and look at the possibility of amalgamation? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. Uh, indeed, it was one that was posed to me uh, uh, now on a, a number of occasions. Uh, I, I think in town meetings that we had in Pictou County, but also by the, the media. And what I have said on the question of amalgamation is that I believe that for amalgamations to be successful, they should take place organically. They should come from the leadership of those communities. And that in the, uh, like uh, the community that I'm originally from, from Queens County, uh, where that process took place, um, uh, and that if it was possible uh, for the government to provide uh, services that would help uh, that uh, discussion to take place, to facilitate it, that the government of Nova Scotia would be happy to work uh, with the municipalities to make that happen. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on your final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just so we can be clear, uh, the Premier, I, I would agree with you. I, I believe that if there's going to be a, mis a municipal amalgamation, it must happen in those communities. They must come forward with a request to, to assess uh, what uh, amalgamation would do for them and their constituents. Uh, but my question to you is, are you prepared to financially support the communities in Pictou County to do a feasibility study on an amalgamation? The Honourable Premier. Well, um, I, I would put it this way, Mr. Speaker. I would certainly be pre pleased to receive the request. Uh, of course, when we're dealing with questions of uh, finance, uh, we would want to see and be able to assess what the costs are, uh, but certainly if they were uh, reasonable and if they were uh, being used in order to head in the direction that would ultimately save money for the Government of Nova Scotia uh, and for the municipalities and uh, expedite services and delivery of services to citizens, uh, of course, uh, we would consider it very seriously. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Premier. The response from the Minister to yesterday's report, res response from the Minister of Education to yesterday's report on tuition support program fell short of addressing the real issue of accommodating the needs of students with learning disabilities in our schools. 
My question to the Premier is this. Recognizing that education for all students must remain a priority for this province, will the Premier explain why his government's support for public schools fell short of the dollars identified by the partners in education, which were just to maintain existing programs? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I suppose the short answer is because of the financial ruin heaped on the province by the former government. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think, uh, I think the, uh, the longer answer has to do with the fact that we are bringing this province uh, back into balance. Uh, that we're doing in a, in, a, in a thoughtful way, and we are prepared to work uh, with uh, the school boards uh, through the Department of Education to ensure uh, that the services required by uh, young people, by uh, students in this province, are uh, properly secured. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party in your first supplementary. Thank you. Enhancing existing programs, expanding services, providing professional development for teachers, hiring teachers with specialized training and learning disabilities are required in order to better accommodate students with learning disabilities. So my question to the Premier is, how does he expect his government to provide these services and supports when he's failed to acknowledge that additional dollars are required to do so? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's, uh, it's not a matter of not wanting to provide additional dollars. The, the simple fact of the matter is that the province finds itself uh, in deep uh, financial difficulty as a result of decisions that were made uh, in the past. Uh, so what we are, uh, what we are uh, attempting to do, of course, is to make sure that there is a, an appropriate balance um, uh, uh, of the expenditures that we have and the, and the financial resources of the province. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that's the answer uh, to the honourable member's question. The honourable leader of the Progressive Conservative Party in your final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Having students educated in their own communities, in their own schools, and with their own peers is important to every family in this province. Having just received unanimous support today for a resolution to ensure that programs for these students uh, will be enhanced, my question to the Premier is this. With the tuition support now limited to three years, what plan exists to address the broader issue of inclusion for students with learning disabilities? The Honourable the Premier. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We set out a, a program yesterday that ensures that these services will be av available for, uh, for parents. And I, <coughs> I understand what uh, the member opposite is saying. Um, the, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we would like to be able to see all of the appropriate services um, covered within um, the uh, public school envelope. Um, however, Mr. Speaker, we recognize the fact that the province has significant financial challenges in front of it over the next number of years, so we are looking at uh, how we can address these issues um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a reasonable fashion um, that recognizes the, those uh, challenges. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, my question is for the, Premier, for the Premier of Promises Made and Promises Broken. Yesterday in the House, the Minister of Finance made an extraordinary comment directed at the finance critic of the Progressive Conservative Party, and I quote, they may be willing to close hospitals, they may be willing to close schools, they may be willing to lay off nurses, they may be willing to lay off teachers, but we are not, end of quote. So my, question, so my question to the Premier, will he confirm, you might even say promise, that his government, that his government will not close schools during his administration? The Honourable Premier. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, of course, uh, all of these uh, decisions are uh, based on our uh, funding of uh, school boards. They make their own decisions. And the, and, and, and the member... And the member uh, knows. The, the, mem the member knows. Uh, the member knows that uh, we are building uh, new schools in many communities, and that when we build new schools, old ones will close. The honourable leader of the official opposition on your first supplementary. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, when the finance minister stood to, re to respond to another question from the finance critic of the Progressive Conservative Party. He said the new member will quickly learn that rhetoric in this house won't get him anywhere. 
Mr. Speaker. My question for the Premier. The Premier has made so many promises. Let me remind you of some of them. No deficit, no increase in debt, no increase in taxes, no ER closures. He was even making those promises during the by-elections of Inverness and Antigonish last fall when he knew he couldn't keep them. So my question to the Premier, will he confirm no teachers will be laid off during his administration? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. What I can confirm is that the funding that is uh, in place uh, for um, the school boards in this uh, in this province um, is going to continue to to increase. Uh, they will use that money to fill um, the uh, human resource demands that they that they need. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive or the uh, Official well, Opposition, Speaker, on your final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, during the election campaign. He was making promises he knew he couldn't keep. Now his finance ministers in this house is making promises he knows he can't deliver on. The Minister of Finance has repeatedly insisted that the health spending in this province is unsustainable. And during budget estimates, the Minister of Health said one of the largest costs to the system is wages. So my question to the Premier, will he confirm that his government will not lay off nurses during his administration as the Minister of Finance promised this house yesterday? The Honourable Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and of course I appreciate the uh, question. What I can uh, tell him is that we will continue uh, to fund uh, the services that Nova Scotia need in the health care system. Uh, what we are not going to do, Mr. Speaker, is to follow uh, the practice of the last uh, Liberal government, which was to close 1,000 hospital beds and lay off or pay 1,500 nurses to leave the system, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, which, we, which, is, which the health care system in Nova Scotia has never recovered from. Here, here, here. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Cape Breton economy is taking another hit, and unemployment is again rising. <coughs> Recently, there was news of 150 people who work for the federal government are being laid off. These people worked at the Citizen and Immigration Centre in Sydney. Those are good jobs, Mr. Speaker, important jobs for Sydney and the surrounding area. My question to the Premier. Were you aware of the pending layoffs, and if so, have you been in contact with Nova Scotia's political minister, Peter McKay, to express your concerns? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I can uh, indicate uh, to the uh, um, uh, to the honourable member that um, uh, I learned about those layoffs. Uh, I would expect in the same way uh, that he did when they were reported. I think uh, you know, first uh, of all by uh, the employees uh, from the centre, and uh, I think at the, once they were uh, notified. Uh, they uh, many of them started to email various members uh, of uh, the uh, uh, of the House of Assembly. So that's uh, how I became aware of it. The honourable member for Cape Breton South, in your first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one would have thought that uh, layoffs of this magnitude that uh, Peter McKay would have contacted the premier to uh, to let him know what was going on, or failing that, that the premier would have contacted Mr. McKay. Uh, to find out uh, what the seriousness of the situation and uh, about the seriousness of the situation and what it means to the economy of Cape Breton. Mr. Speaker, this is devastating news for those employees and their families. This government, Mr. Speaker, turned its back uh, in Yarmouth and, and uh, with the ferry service. It gave no help or encouragement to the people in Port Hawkesbury, no help for the people of Cancel or Shetty Camp. My question again to the Premier. What is your Minister of Economic Development doing to provide assistance to the people of Sydney in the wake of this devastating news? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. What I, uh, what I can say is that uh, um, we are in uh, constant touch with uh, the uh, members of the uh, uh, federal government, uh, the various ministers in uh, relation to this uh, matter. Um, we, um, we've uh, raised it with them, and I've also instructed uh, my officials to make sure that that, uh, that objection is officially on, uh, on record as well uh, by way of a letter from my office. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton South in your final supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I heard the Premier right, he said that there was a letter gone from his office to the Minister regarding this problem? 
Would the, would the uh, Premier table that letter in the House today? So all Nova Scotians uh, will, uh, will be able to judge whether or not uh, uh, that was the appropriate letter to be sent to the Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, government has a host of programs that could help the skilled employees who are facing the loss of their jobs, both financially and with retraining opportunities so they can stay in the area. And yet, just like the workers in Yarmouth, this government is telling the workers in Sydney, you're on your own. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Premier, will you commit to sending officials from various departments to meet with these workers in Sydney to provide them with the resources they need to retrain or prepare for other jobs, or better still, Mr. Speaker, uh, to use uh, the Premier's office to convince the federal government to cancel the job cuts? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just so I'm clear with the uh, member opposite, I said I've instructed my officials to uh, send a letter to um, uh, the, the uh, federal government so that uh, our objection to this is officially on record. Uh, that's what I said. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, um, I know that uh, the people of Cape Breton have two representatives who are um, who are uh, also uh, there to represent their interests with respect to the federal government. I would expect that they are uh, doing that as well. And certainly, um, if there's any assistance we can be to those employees, uh, we would want to uh, be able to do that. But I understand that Service Canada uh, would uh, also be uh, providing uh, many of those transition services. Uh, thank you. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Finance. In 2004, 2005, 2007, and possibly in the voice recorded vote in 2006, the Minister of Finance voted in favour of budgets tabled by the Progressive Conservative Government. Did you use your personal judgment to evaluate these budgets before you voted for them? To the Minister of Finance. The Honourable Minister of Finance. <laughs> order, order, please. The uh, Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the member is establishing a pattern of asking, uh, asking uh, questions. The first, and then I, I know, I know the kicker's in the third question. So maybe you could just skip straight to his third question. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the, the budget presented by a government represents their plan for the next year of the government of the province. And of course, uh, each year, Mr. Speaker, I, along with my colleagues, would evaluate that plan and vote accordingly. The Honourable Member for Inverness on your first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't vote for a budget if I didn't believe in it, and I certainly won't be voting for this budget. <laughs> Why today, Mr. Speaker, does the Minister of Finance say that past government decisions created a mess when he voted for them? The, the Honourable Minister of Finance. Th Mr. Mr. Speaker. Okay. Mr. Speaker, uh, this budget, among other things, includes a measure that will make put $12.5 million in the hands of seniors with an income low enough to receive guaranteed income supplement. I'm very proud of that, Mr. Speaker, and I think that any member who votes against that should be ashamed. The um, Honourable Member for Inverness on your final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, since I didn't get an answer, I'm going to ask the same question again to the Minister. Why did he vote for past budgets that he didn't believe in? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, the, bu the budget represents a plan of the government for the following year. These days, the budgets are $9 billion, covering the entire scope of, of government uh, programs and services, Mr. Speaker. And of course, I, every year, like my colleagues, evaluate the entire plan. And Mr. Speaker, I have to say that this year's plan is the most fair and most balanced plan I've ever seen in this House. The 
Order. Order the Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Nancy Brockway, a U.S. consumer advocate working with Nova Scotia's consumer advocate John Merrick, has raised concerns about Nova Scotia Power's demand-side management plan for 2011. It seems only a few thousand ho households will benefit from the programs being proposed, and this is under a scheme that the NDP once opposed. In fact, I'll quote the Premier. He said at the, at the time in June, this is the wrong time to impose a rate surcharge for the next three years. The bottom line here is affordability. I'll table that press release, uh, which I've tabled before many times. But it was effectively then endorsed by the NDP when the Efficiency Nova Scotia Act was introduced in the last session. So, Mr. Speaker, what is the Minister's position on the proposal to gain to again increase power bills for Nova Scotians, justified by a scheme that appears to have little benefit for most Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. You know, I too read the, the business section of, of, the, of the Halifax Herald after the sports section, incidentally. I, too, of course, recognize the comments of that U.S. consumer advocate. And, uh, you know, there's always an opportune time when complex issues of this nature are being discussed. It's important to hear from all sides. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to having to follow up conversations with uh, the, the proponent in this particular example, and it's something that we'll look forward to in the future. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on your first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Minister of Energy would be happy to know, and I, I not only read the Herald, but I also read the consultant's report, which I hope he read, which says, quote, the lack of clarity about purposes and prioritization of demand-side management investments poses a significant risk of suboptimal, if not imprudent, investment. Mr. Speaker, the consultant points out that while all Nova Scotians will pay another power rate increase, the programs proposed by the funds, such as rebates on high-efficiency washers and dryers, will have the most benefit to high-income earners who can most afford the programs. So, Mr. Speaker, how does the minister feel about the fact that higher-income households will be more uh, able to participate in the proposed demand-side management programs than lower-income households? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I compliment the member opposite for continuing to do his homework. This, this issue, of course, is before the Utility and Review Board. Uh, there's likely to be a, a lot of information and various opinions, and uh, those various opinions and pieces of information are important as we go forward to look at the various options ahead of us. This particular consumer advocate has one of the suggestions. There are many more coming, and those are the ones we're looking forward to hearing from. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on your final supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess I can only assume the NDP Cabinet is happy that they will be able to afford the proposed programs, just like the Finance Minister's ministerial tax cut. It appears the benefits are quickly accruing to members of the NDP Cabinet out of the pockets of hard-working Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, the House will recall that I proposed amendments to the Efficiency Nova Scotia Act prior to it being passed by this House to address some of the concerns, the very concerns now being raised by this consumer advocate, but the Minister chose not to support those amendments at the time. Mr. Speaker, my question, as consumers see power bills rising again under this NDP government, quickly wiping out the savings from the HST cut, will the minister take action to ensure that DSM funds benefit the majority of Nova Scotians and prioritize low- and middle-income families? The Honourable Minister of Energy. I'm not going to accept the information from the member or advice from the member from Cape Breton Nova on this particular question. You know, the complexities, the complexities of this issue and the information that's being presented, it's important that we listen to all involved. At no time in the 12 years I've been in this House did I ever espouse the fact I have all the answers, and I advise that member opposite to accept that for a while and stop proposing all the answers. <laughs> Good one. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton North. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Mr. Speaker, air service to and from Sydney is becoming a major concern in the area with regards to the rates uh, that Air Canada are charging. I want to table before the House uh, on, on uh, April 6th to 7th, the cheapest fare possible was $1,442.16. 
And Mr. Speaker, I went to look today, uh, April 15th, returning Friday, uh, the cheapest flight possible is $1,326. And Mr. Speaker, Cape Bretoners needing to travel, especially for medical travel, this is very prohibitive to them. And my question to the uh, Minister is, is he prepared to intervene with Air Canada? And if yes, what are you prepared to do, Minister? Thank you. The uh, Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite on this very important topic. I have an upcoming uh, commitment in beautiful Cape Breton, in fact, in the particular town of Dominion coming ahead on April the 25th, at which time I've been given the responsibilities to MC an important event for a certain favoured MLA in that community. <laughs> And let me assure, and not making light of any way of looking at this, my first reaction was, I must see what a flight would cost. And I certainly share that concern, I want you to know. In the past, we have encouraged the possibility of allowing other carriers to come in and provide service to the Sydney market. Then, of course, as you would know, as a regular user, you see what happens. This is an ongoing problem. I look forward to working with the members of this side of the House and the members opposite who use that regular carrier so, to see that if we can get some positive solutions. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton North on your first supplementary. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate the Minister's response, and I hope that he'll take advantage of the opportunity while in Cape Breton to meet with the Sydney Airport Authority uh, to go over the concerns that have been there. And as the Minister knows, he's indicated, another carrier comes in and all of a sudden the Air Canada prices go down and try and drive that carrier out of the marketplace, which is unfair. Now, we're going to seasonal opportunities, but I do want to note there is another opportunity to the Minister because the Halifax Chamber of Commerce will be hosting the President and CEO of Air Canada here on Wednesday May 19th for one of their Distinguished Speaker Series. And I'm hoping that'll be an opportunity while the President and CEO of Care Canada here is not just to talk about platitudes and all the great things they're doing through Halifax, but to be able to address the real concern of price gouging going on to and from Cape Breton. And so I'm wondering if the Minister can confirm that he'll make efforts to meet with the President and CEO of Air Canada while he's here in Halifax and address this directly. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I'm not sure of my commitments on the 19th. If it can be arranged, uh, we'll see what we can do. I, I want to assure the members opposite, and I want to assure members of this side of the House and all Nova Scotians who continue to use the opportunity to travel to, to beautiful Cape Breton by air through Sydney, that we will continue to push for competition and open markets, because that's, after all, the best way to serve the people of Cape Breton and to serve the customers with the potential of visiting Cape Breton. The Honourable Member of Cape Breton North on your final supplementary. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I agree with regards to an open competitive marketplace, but when we have a monopoly that's driving costs up that are unfair, that are unfair to the consumers, especially for those on, on fixed incomes to be able to travel, we know a lot of people can't go for medical uh, uh, appointments at these kind of dollars. And one other thing, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to do is to ask the minister responsible for communications Nova Scotia in terms of where the government's plan would be if he can respond to this, given his intimate knowledge of the challenges in Cape Breton. Sure. The Honourable uh, Minister responsible for communications Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the route that question took is as mixed up as an Air Canada route. <laughs> so, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I wholly, wholeheartedly agree with the, with the member, and I'm sure I look across here and see the other members from Cape Breton that, that, that are experiencing the same difficulty in, in the costs, and, and uh, clearly we would uh, 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 certainly a, a, a like to support anything that 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 would uh, make air travel in anywhere in this province uh, more reasonable and uh, clearly uh, we support this as as the uh, the CBRM was a leader in this in a year a couple of years ago and they made representation but uh, Mr. Speaker with that said the reality is that the demise and 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 the, the and the real injury done on small airports was in the Mulroney area of, era of deregulation, and that really hurt that airport. And Mr. Speaker, we, we, along with many members, though, will continue to push Air Canada and its subsidiary or, or its partner, if you will, Jazz, to, to come up with reasonable uh, airfares for people that uh, have to travel here to the capital and make uh, uh, a reasonable effort to grow the economy in Cape Breton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove. 
Mr. Speaker, in Tuesday's debate on estimates, I asked the Community Services Minister about a case involving a senior in my riding. Her daytime home support worker had not been receiving minimum wage. Now, the NDP had been keen to publicize her plight before the election, but they dragged their heels afterwards. And it was only when the son of this woman threatened to talk to me that suddenly, six months after the election, they received the news that the worker would get minimum wage. My question is for the Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. Is this government committed to enforcing the minimum wage in this province? The um, Honourable uh, Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not clear um, as to the, the function of this particular worker, and um, certainly I'd be willing to sit down with the honourable member and discuss the details, provide a, a more thorough uh, a comment later. Thank you. The honourable member for Bedford Birch Cove, on your first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Maybe I need to write it down on a napkin or a serviette or something like that. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the home support worker is now receiving the minimum wage, and for that, the family is very appreciative. But they do feel that Services for Persons with Disabilities, a program in the Department of Community Services, underpaid this worker for a year. They have asked repeatedly for the back pay to be paid to her. They have not received a response to those queries. Now, on Tuesday, the Minister of Community Services told me that the home support worker should file a complaint with Labour and Workforce Development. And that's direction I appreciate, but my question is to the Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. Why should a 65-year-old woman on minimum wage have to fight your department for what she's owed? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Certainly, the uh, Department of Labour and Workforce Development um, puts in place the processes by which people can appeal uh, differences of opinion in their work situation. Again, I don't know the details of this particular issue, and I'm certainly willing to check into it and get back to the honourable member. Thank you. The honourable member for Bedford Birch Cove on your final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, when I brought this issue up Tuesday, uh, the Minister of Community Services told me there would be no reprisals or no re retribution if a Nova Scotian complained about issues like this. But my constituent faxed me a letter received in response to requests for back pay for the home care worker. Mr. Speaker, the letter states that should your support needs increase, you will be offered an assessment for a residential placement within the most appropriate program. Her son and his family with whom she lives is very shaken up because they did not ask for an increase in her care. Mr. Speaker, they feel this is clearly a threat. My question to the Minister of Community Services, is this letter the departmental equivalent of shut up or we'll put you in a home? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, definitely not. That's just an explanation that there's an alternative route for the family to t take and in no way implies any kind of, of threat. So, well, they may not have asked, but it, you know one thing is we like to try to give as much information as possible, and that's what they were doing. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton North. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question through to you is the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we all know that the oil and gas sector has been very important and vital to Nova Scotia. You would have to look no further than the harbour of Halifax. We all know that, they're, that they've been a key uh, driver for revenues for this province. However, uh, with Deep Pinook delayed and Tier 3 of Sable left adrift, will the Minister of Energy inform this House what, if anything, the government plans to do to restart development in our oil and gas sector? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Cape Breton North for another important question on another important issue. Uh, I, I share your concern, but in light of the comments and the tone that was set yesterday with being positive, I think it's always important for us to remember the glass is half full, it's not half empty. And I remember that analogy how many years ago when the Premier at the time, Gerald Regan, stood with that little vial 
and the good days were ahead. Let, let me assure you that you know, Nova Scotia is open for business. That message is continually <coughs> demonstrated to our partners. We reassure those companies involved in the offshore. We are looking forward to a bright future. There are, I should say, in a tactful way as possible, some sensitive discussions underway. And those sensitive discussions, we're all involved, we're going to say that Nova Scotia still does have a bright future in the offshore. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton North on your first supplementary. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I do want to thank the Honourable Minister for being positive about this, and I do credit him with that. But, Mr. Speaker, for months now, both the Premier and his Robin Hood over there have bemoaned the decline in revenues from offshore, yet have failed miserably when it comes to reviving this vital economic sector. Exploratory drilling, seismic and development activity have dried up as much as the finance minister's thinking. Mr. Speaker, can the positive Minister of Energy explain to this House why his Premier <laughs> and the Minister of Finance fail to understand, appreciate and support him in his quest to grow the oil and gas sector in Nova Scotia? The, the Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you. Um, Robin Hood, Friar Tucker, Little John, those analogies aside, you know, I, I want the member opposite to know that when this particular topic is discussed, whether at our caucus or in other discussions, I have the complete and utter support of my Premier and the Minister of Finance. We are fully on side with the fact that we have a bright future and we're going to work with partners. We're going to make sure the message is out there among industry interests that Nova Scotia is still in the offshore game and we're going to make it a winner in this province. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton North and your final supplementary. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I appreciate the Minister's positive outlook on things. But, Mr. Speaker, exploration from the Laurentian sub-basin to George's Bank should have been a priority for this government decrying loss and declining revenues, yet they've chosen to spend time, and the Minis Minister of Finance has, about the financial woes in New Brunswick. The Minister of Finance has spent much time engaged in the, in the blame game rather than tending to the actual work of growing the economy. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Energy, since the, the Premier and the Minister of Finance won't, inform this House of the specific plans he has to incent, invest and explore our offshore revenues and resources? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Uh, thank you again to the member opposite. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The specifics at this time would not be appropriate to bring forward on the floor of the House. I'm being positive again. Uh, when questions are asked in this House of this nature to me in whatever portfolio, I wish I could divulge some of the details that are involved. I want to reassure the member opposite that there are sensitive discussions underway and the best interest of Nova Scotia and the best interest of the offshore will be taken care of, but I do thank you for your interest. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Kings West. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, the Brigadoon Children's Camp Society is a real success story in Nova Scotia. This organization will have an exceptional year-round facility for children and youth living with chronic illness. We know recently, Mr. Speaker, that the Minister of Natural Resources, the member from King's South, met with the society because most of the Wagner lands needed by Brigadoon are in her riding. My question to the Minister of Natural Resources, what action are you taking to meet the request by Brigadoon to secure the neighbouring lands owned by Wagner Forest Management? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I thank the member uh, for his question. Um, actually, I'm, I'm not taking any action at this present time. I have to say that uh, uh, my staff tried very hard uh, to purchase uh, that property that the member uh, raised in, in question. Uh, and uh, I, can, I can tell the member, uh, I think the price, that we're kind of limited uh, by appraised value, but, but even my staff tried to, uh, tried to push the, the size of the parcel uh, to take in actually more land so we could kind of come in close to the uh, appraised value as possible. Uh, we did need, uh, we were right to our, our limit uh, for what we could uh, try to do. And we needed a little, a little bit of give on the on the side of the of the people who own the property. Uh, we couldn't get it, and uh, so um, 
actually, so we, could, we couldn't acquire it. They, they, uh, they worked very hard to try to acquire that piece of property and we're, we're unable to do it. The Honourable Member for Kings West on your first supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I think uh, all Nova Scotians interested in Brigadoon were hoping that Wagner, in fact, would be a good corporate citizen here. However, the bargaining has been tough. I'd like to come back to the Minister with, but why did you not procure enough acres from Wagner in your negotiations to preserve a buffer for Brigadoon Children's Camp? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, we even tried that, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, but uh, they were un they were unwilling to uh, to go where we were trying to go, and uh, they owned the property, and uh, so uh, uh, we couldn't really take it. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, we we couldn't come to an agreement. The Honourable Member for Kings West on your final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, having free and nearby access to the wilderness surrounding the camp is a key component to Brigadoon's success. This organization has tremendous support from community, from business, and from government. However, if there is not a buffer zone between Brigadoon and any potential development by Wagner, the camp may not achieve what will be a world-class facility. My question to the Minister, for less than $2 million, why can't you find a way to ensure no development will be going on next door to Brigadoon? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can tell the member it was quite a bit less than that. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, that, that we couldn't get them to, uh, to move. And uh, so, uh, look, um, I, uh, I want the member to understand uh, we thought that was an important purchase. Um, we could not uh, get to where we needed to be, and uh, as much as uh, I think my staff and and I regret that, um, you're dealing with the uh, we're dealing with the private sector. It was their property. Uh, we couldn't uh, we we couldn't uh, come to an agreement that would allow us to purchase it, Mr. Speaker. And uh, maybe at some point in the future, before anything happens that would that would jeopardize that that uh, project, there there may be a possibility. But I would say. Presently, it seems like that door is closed. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Digby, Annapolis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question will be for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Heritage. Mr. Speaker, tourism operators in the province believe that this coming tourism season may be one of the worst since they started in their business. The Minister of Finance is scaring everybody to death with these belt tightening and tax increases, and on top of that, we've lost a tourism ferry out of western Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, many people have been made to believe that a luxury such as traveling should come last in their personal budgets, and our tourism businesses will suffer for this. My question to the Minister, does the Minister realize that this has taken place, and what is he doing about it? The Honourable Minister of Tourism, Culture and Heritage. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with respect to tourism in Nova Scotia, and I, I think it's important for me to point out that the Department of Tourism has worked very hard in the last, uh, in the last 10 months, and I think the, uh, the numbers have indicated that. Even in a time of recession, uh, these troubled times, is that uh, our uh, tourism industry has remained a $1.3 billion industry. And I will assure the member uh, opposite that's, uh, that's asking the questions that we will continue. As a matter of fact, we've just started to uh, uh, showcase uh, some uh uh, some videos and some commercials that are highlighting uh, Nova Scotia in a very, very positive way. We will continue uh, to put those strategies in place to keep the tourism market at a level that's acceptable to all Nova Scotians, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Digby Annapolis on your first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the previous government promised to double our tourism business in this province by 2012. The Liberal government grew tourism, and since the Conservatives and NDP have taken over, tourism hasn't grown one bit. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister, are you going to follow through on the previous government's commitment to double tourism in Nova Scotia by 2012? 
The Honourable Minister of Tourism, Culture and Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I wish I did have a crystal ball. That was then, this is now. Times have changed. The Canadian dollar, the, can, the Canadian dollar is at a par now with the U.S. dollar, which is not necessarily a good thing when it comes to tourism. Mr. Speaker, we just came through a recession. Uh, these are different times. Different times require different measures. I'm not about uh, to look up uh, or to try to fulfill any. Uh, I'm not about to try to fulfill any promises that I didn't have input into, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member for Digby Annapolis on your final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, there's always going to be tourists no matter what goes on in this world. Right now, there's just fewer of them. Unless we change what the Department of Tourism is doing, we're going to see even fewer tourists to this province. Mr. Speaker, these fewer tourists that are going to travel will want to see something special and unique. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia has one of the most unique attractions in the world, and that's our famous Bay of Fundy. Mr. Speaker, the Bay of Fundy is up for candidacy for one of the seven natural wonders of North America. What a wonderful gift we've been given. What is your Department of Tourism doing to promote this special and unique natural wonder that will attract a good share of these fewer tourists to this province? The Honourable Minister of Tourism, Culture and Heritage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do agree with the uh, member opposite that uh, we have a great attraction uh, with respect to the Bay of Fundy. And uh, I can remember uh, in my hometown, I can remember uh, boasting about the highest tides in the world in Windsor, Nova Scotia, which unfortunately we, we, uh, we've since lost uh, with uh, with result of the causeway. But we, uh, we continue. Uh, to advertise, or I could say piggyback, on the Bay of Fundy, and we will continue. We will continue to advertise not only the Bay of Fundy, but all the other unique experiences that one can have here in the province of Nova Scotia, which the uh, honourable member alludes to. We will continue to, to advertise uh, 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 through our websites, through all those channels of communication, including uh, social media. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, through you, my question will be to the Premier. And, and ironically, we're talking about highest tides and I'm going to talk about the highest taxes. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Premier, I want to quote from an article today in the Cumberland County newspaper talking about cross-border shopping. These quotes are from a New, New Brunswick business person, and I quote, People already drive over here from Amherst for gas and milk because of the significant price difference in both items, said Chris Harborn, owner of Downtown Digital on Main Street in Sackville. So adding another 2% on top of that should be a benefit for Sackville businesses. My question to the Premier through you, Mr. Speaker, is this. Has the Premier ordered a review of lost business, lost provincial revenue, and potential job loss because, his, because of his government's decision to raise taxes? And if he hasn't, will he do so, please? The Honourable the Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, as the uh, member uh, knows, uh, the Minister of Finance will be uh, in Amherst tomorrow. Uh, he's going to be speaking uh, with uh, 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 the business community there. He's going to review a number of matters. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm sure that he will have uh, some uh, information that he's going to be able to share uh, with them. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South and your first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, my first supplementary through you to the Premier. And, the, and this article, Mr. Premier, goes on to say, this move, this increase in taxes, is expected to result in an increase in cross-border traffic into New Brunswick, particularly an influx of, of shoppers who are looking for 2% savings on bigger ticket items such as TVs or home renovation materials. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Premier, will the Premier finally admit breaking his election promise not to raise taxes is going to severely hurt Nova Scotia, especially Cumberland County, and be to, to the benefit of New Brunswick, which has already said, contrary to the Minister of Finance here, they have said they will not be raising the HST. The Honourable Premier. 
Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I would just point out to the member opposite that the 15% uh, uh, HST rate was in place for, I think, a decade uh, of the last uh, 13 years. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, the, the businesses in the, the businesses in Amherst, the businesses in Amherst uh, were uh, able to uh, uh, to operate during that time. Uh, I know that they uh, uh, were, we uh, we're certainly not uh, happy with the the fact that we had to uh, take this measure to raise revenue. But unfortunately, because of decisions that were made by the previous government, um, driving the, 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 the province uh, so deeply uh, into debt, uh, it is a necessary matter. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South and your final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, through you, my final supplementary to the Premier. Convenience store operators, gas retailers and others have either closed or say they will be closing as a result of the cross-border shopping issue, and especially the government's direct hit on them by raising taxes, which this promise, the Premier promised he would not do. Will the Premier commit today to putting in government resources in place in Cumberland County and its, to help its citizens and its business so they can continue to provide jobs and survive throughout this very difficult situation? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, there is a deep irony in the member's question, simply because this government uh, came forward with a, a plan to try and assist gasoline retailers in the uh, area, and it was vigorously opposed uh, by uh, by the member. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a shame. But what he can uh, what he can rely on the government to do is to continue to look for ways to try and strengthen uh, that community, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove. Mr. Speaker, last Friday, the 2009 Workers' Compensation Board Annual Report was released, and the report stated that over 28,000 Nova Scotians were injured at work that year. Now, I recognize that this was a significant decrease from the year before, and I appreciate the work that is being done. But 28,000 workers were injured last year. Year after year, these statistics remain startling. My question is to the Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. What new actions is this government taking to ensure the numbers significantly decline over the next year? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, one of the priorities of this government is uh, a safe workplace. And uh, we are initiating a number of uh, of um, initiatives, including uh, streamlining um, the, um, the process in terms of w the, uh, the workplace safety uh, insurance system. We're working closely with uh, the Workers' Compensation Board. They are putting in place a number of different uh, safety um, associations. And um, it's interesting, we just recently heard um, from the um, the province of Alberta, and uh, they're, I think, perhaps the fourth or fifth province that have uh, adopted the, uh, the advertising, the, the safety promotion campaign that many of us are familiar with, with uh, throughout the media, and uh, they, they feel it's an excellent uh, campaign, and I believe it's actually up for an award, although we haven't heard the, uh, the results of that. So um, we're doing a number of things to decrease uh, the, uh, the workplace uh, injury and death. The um, Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove in your first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I do note that the uh, injury rates for Alberta are significantly lower than they are here in Nova Scotia. Despite the progress, we have some serious challenges here in Nova Scotia. Our neighbours in New Brunswick are doing much better. The injury rate in New Brunswick was 1.36 per 100 covered employees. The injury rate in Nova Scotia is 2.26. Can the minister explain the significant difference in the injury rates between the two provinces? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in Nova Scotia, we have responsibility for creating safe workplaces in this province, and those are the figures. One, one injury, one death is, is one too many. And I just want to mention that we've done a number of initiatives to try to uh, create 
understanding of their, their rights and workplace safety situation with uh, first-time workers. And so we've added um, a six to eight hour part of the curriculum in grade nine to help young workers, perhaps starting off in their first jobs, to better appreciate the, the things that they need to be aware of um, when they start their, their new jobs. Because unfortunately, one of the highest rates seems to be with our younger workers. But we're doing, we have a, a menu of comprehensive uh, strategies that we're, we're using to try to make workplaces as safe as possible in this province. The Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove and your final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Minister, for outlining that, that new uh, program for Grade 9 workers. These are kids who are going out into the workplace, so it's important that they have some of the background information. I note that WorkSafe NB's health and safety officers conducted 8,548 workplace inspections in 2009. The word inspection appears nowhere in the Nova Scotia Workers' Compensation Board report. Will the minister please tell us how many inspections it does on an annual basis and why the number and was not published in the Workers' Compensation Board report? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd be pleased to get the numbers, but I think the reason it's not in the annual report uh, for the Workers' Compensation Board is because it's the uh, Department of Labour and Workforce Development that does the inspections, but I would be pleased to, uh, to get the actual number and uh, report back to the House. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, through you, uh, my question is for the Minister of Justice. Very simply, can the Minister of Justice tell this House if he has ever spoken personally to federal officials or the Minister of Public Safety federally about potential cost savings that may be possible by partnering with the federal government in regards to locating a uh, provincial or federal correctional facility in, in Cumberland County? Yes, sir, no. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Yes. I haven't. The Honourable uh, Member for Cumberland South and your first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, you know, that's about what I expected. After the Minister raised the issue the other day about this, this side of the House going to Ottawa to do the government's business, I would have thought at least the Minister would have had an opportunity to speak with someone federally. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I spoke to the, the Minister and I spoke to the, the government in Ottawa. In fact, they were surprised that the Dexter government never once ever raised the issue of a possible partnership with them in regards to corrections. Can the Minister tell this House why he's turned his back on the correctional officers and forcing families to make decisions about splitting up, falling jobs out of the county, and why he's given up on Cumberland County. Can the minister tell the House that? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, first off, we haven't turned our backs on anyone. As we said, uh, dealing with Cumberland County, the issue of the jail was is that uh, it was not in the best interest of all Nova Scotians, uh, nor corrections itself. So as a result, we conduct, are conducting a, an overall study on to where best to put the jail and what type of facility is best for this province. And as a result of that, that process is well underway, as I reported several times in this House before. And I'm looking forward to getting that information so the decision for a first-class uh, correctional institution will be built in Nova Scotia and will serve all Nova Scotians and be tax savings to uh, to uh, all Nova Scotians, and we can reinvest those tax savings into communities such as your neighbourhood. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South and your final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my final supplementary will be, will be the Premier. Final supplementary through you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, will be the Premier. Can the Premier explain to this House, but even more importantly, to the people of Cumberland County, why he's allowing for the loss of jobs and services from Cumberland County with a ne negative impact on the economy and especially a negative impact on those families, those correctional officers' families. And he hasn't even ensured that every possible opportunity has been explored with the federal government for saving money or by saving uh, uh, finances through geothermal energy in Spring Hill using high water. The Honourable Premier. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the work that's being done by the Minister of Justice is being done to ensure that the corrections uh, um, uh, service will have the best possible facility uh, in order to accommodate the, uh, the, the needs of the Department of Justice and, of course, uh, of uh, the, the people of this province, Mr. Speaker. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 uh, the question could well be posed to the, to the member himself, because, of course, Mr. Speaker, the problem, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the minister said that there was, uh, that this proposal was made prior to the last election and the commitment made, and yet there was no business plan. There was nothing in place that, that, that addressed issues like exactly the ones that he has just raised, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, a few days ago, there was a fundraiser in Halifax in order to raise funds to help an individual to rent a new wheelchair. Uh, the wheelchair she currently uses is worn out, and medical insurance did not cover the cost for a wheelchair. Her friends wanted to help her out because the government would not. The guidelines for the wheelchair recycling program are too strict. So my first question to the minister, is this individual the only person who has been turned down for the wheelchair recycling program and is there a waiting list? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One thing that I can tell the Honourable Member is that I'm very proud with the fact that the Abilities Foundation, who are now called Easter Seals, I've met with them uh, numerous times, and my uh, department has, and uh, although I can't talk about an individual case, I would encourage uh, the individual to make contact with them because we've been extremely supportive of their wheelchair program. It's a fabulous program. It is turning around the lives of many people that wouldn't have the ability or accessibility to a wheelchair. So I would make that recommendation to the honourable member to pass that information along. Thank you. Order, order. The time for oral question period has expired. Uh, the honourable member for Cumberland South. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, on the point of order, Mr. Speaker, every day in this House, the Premier continues to mislead the people of Nova Scotia. Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, as a Premier, he would know this province spent a million dollars on the crux of facilities leading up to his government canceling a project. He would know cabinet documents would prove that money was in place. He would know it was in the budget. He would know there's design done. And he would know the people of Cumberland County know they, he's turned their back on them. He can say all he wants in this place here. Cumberland County okay. knows the difference, Mr. Thank Speaker. You, uh, and I will provide the documents to this House in a future day. But I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, there's a legal process that's going to unfold. We'll challenge you on those okay. on Thank the, you, uh, comments uh, you made here today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Honourable Speaker. Member. Brought forward here earlier today. Um, I'm also going to ask to request the House, unanimous consent of the House, in regards to Bill 15, which was brought forward by the Cape, member for Cape Breton West, that we also set, uh, when we set aside the business of the House, I'm asking also that the issue of the committee work that would normally take place through a uh, committee, through, uh, through a law amendment, that we process through, through second reading and third reading today, so this bill can be moved out of the House today, be ready for proclamation. Uh, uh, first of all, on. First of all, on your point of order, uh, honourable member, I, I'll, I'll order order on your point of order. I will take that under advisement for starters. Uh, your second uh, point was uh, on bill bill 15. A point of order. Speaker, if, if there's going to be denial on this request, then I would ask to record a vote in this house. The honourable government house leader, Mr. Speaker. All it needs, if, if, in, in, in the absence of, of, uh, of uh, unanimous consent, there's no necessary, it's not necessary to have a, uh, a recorded vote, but if he wishes. So the question is uh, to proceed with Bill 15, uh, but I'll recognize the um, op official opposition House Leader first. On a point of order, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, regarding that issue, Mr. Speaker, uh, it would appear the mood has changed from when the guests left the Speaker's gallery until now. Uh, but having said that, uh, this is not a precedent of this House. This has been done before on important bills that are in the, in the public's interest. And all the member from Cumberland South was asking was that we fast-track this bill. We fast-tracked other bills that, 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 that would not seem to be controversial bills. You know, and, and for the government to deny unanimous consent for that today speaks volumes about how they really feel about this issue. 
Mr. Well, I will put the question to the House then, uh, uh, you know, on Bill 15, uh, whether uh, you want to proceed with it uh, through the various stages here today. So the question is, uh, on Bill 15, are we um, um, going to proceed, uh, proceed here today? So I'll ask for a, I'll ask for a question. Uh, the Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, the House has already agreed the second reading of that bill. So the business of the House will be set aside now. We've already agreed to second reading. That's true. The, the further request is to, to do what I said a moment ago. So we're going to second reading regardless because the House already decided. Yeah. But I'm, re I'm requesting in light of what I'm requesting in light of what the Premier early said, earlier said here today, what a historical moment in this province, and I agree totally. What I'm asking is that the precedent as a member for Kirk K. Burton South has said has been set many, many times that we proceed through second, third reading, and we and we set aside the issue of committee, law amendments, and committee of the whole, so that we can put it through the House today on this historical day and get it ready to be moved for proclamation. Okay. Uh, the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm uh, pleased to address this issue. Mr. Speaker, uh, we want this matter to move to second reading. That was the request that was made. We believe that there is work that needs to be done in order to improve the bill. That should be done in law amendments. That is, uh, Mr. Speaker, what was agreed to. That is why the, the, the member wants to change what he proposed is, uh, you know, is beyond me. He must recognize that there is a process that if we can improve the, ball, the bill in law amendments, that, that would be desirable for everybody. Okay. Order, order. We have agreed uh, earlier to have second reading of Bill 15. The further question is, uh, do we have unanimous agreement to proceed to other stages of the bill? I hear a no, uh, so we'll proceed then with second reading on Bill 15. Uh, the, or, uh, the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could you please call private members' public bills for second reading? Private members' public uh, bills for second reading. Uh, Mr. Speaker, could you please call Bill 15, the Viola Desmond Day Act? Bill number 15, the Viola Desmond Day Act. Uh, sir, Speaker on Bill 15. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Honourable Member for Cape Breton West. How do you miss uh, me? I, I, I'm quite surprised, Mr. Speaker, that you could actually miss me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise on my feet today to talk on Bill 15, the Viola Desmond Act. Today in this house, in the Red Chamber, we've seen a government move forward to right a wrong, a wrong that has been in identified and has lasted for 64 years. The reason for bringing this bill forward to talk and name a day after Viola Desmond is very important. Uh, when we started out, the government of this house of the day had made a very good gesture towards the family, towards African Nova Scotians in this province. And now they seem to want to play games with this act. And I'm sorry, I'm very, very sorry to hear that, Mr. Minister, Mr. Speaker. But what I am proud of is the fact that Wanda Robson was here today and she's seen a correction made to something she felt had been bad for her sister, her family, and for her heritage. And this government had the courage to stand up and change that. And now they want to say, play silly games with this passing of a bill. Now, what is it? Why is it important, Mr. Speaker? Why is it important to have a day called Viola Desmond Day? Because if we don't have such a day in the province of Nova Scotia, people will forget what took place. The whole idea behind declaring Viola Desmond Day was so that Nova Scotians would never forget where we were at and where we've come from and what we've accomplished. It was so the people would remember, Mr. Speaker, that these times that we enjoy in Nova Scotia, the freedoms and the rights that we enjoy, did not come easy. These rights came as a result of people making personal sacrifice. We look around and we say to ourselves, 
Will we remember this? Well, Mr. Speaker, one of the things that prompted our caucus to bring this bill forward was the very fact that it is important that it be remembered. Important the same day, way as Remembrance Day. A lot of people in the province of Nova Scotia and right across Canada don't really understand what Remembrance Day is all about anymore. And that's why the legions have started going into the schools to educate our children, to give our children a sense of what did take place and why we celebrate Remembrance Day. It's not just a day off of school. It's not just a holiday. There were some significant occurrences that took place that gave us, the people of Nova Scotia, the members that sit in this house, it gave us some privileges that sometimes, Mr. Speaker, sometimes we forget and we just take for granted. So the whole idea of Remembrance Day is being brought forward by our veterans to young people. The same thing, in my opinion, and our caucus's opinion, can be done with Viola Desmond Day. It is an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for people to remember a significant date in our history. Who was Viola Desmond? What did she do? What did she accomplish? Do you realize that she was fully nine years ahead of Rosa Parks? We talk about Rosa Parks as being a leader, but we were five, nine years ahead here in the province of Nova Scotia. This woman, this woman was a teacher. She was a business person. She was a person who was driving to make things better for her community, for her heritage, and for her province. And on a drive to Sydney to deliver supplies to a student of hers who had gone through her beauty college, she had car trouble, and she stopped in New Glasgow. Why did she do that? She had to fix her car. She went into a theater, and she sat in the wrong seat, and was told that she had to move, Mr. Speaker, had to leave. And in the days, somebody arrested her and charged her with not paying the right tax. Today, we are looking at where things are. We're wondering why, indeed, do we recognize Viola Desmond. The government of this province saw fit to right what they believed was a wrong that occurred in 64, 64 years ago. And Mr. Speaker, they were right in doing that. Here, here. They were right in correcting something that went wrong. And they should be applauded for doing that. They should be applauded. And I give them credit for doing it. What I don't understand, Mr. Speaker, is why all of a sudden, why all of a sudden there's a change in their attitude towards this. So, Mr. Speaker, this bill, this bill is a bill that should pass today. It's a bill that could pass today with the unanimous consent of this House. And it is a bill that would finish a job that was started by this government this morning. A government that said, we want to recognize a wrong, we want to fix a wrong, and now, Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that people don't forget that in the province of Nova Scotia, we're proud of what we were able to do, and we are right, want to make sure that we remember the kind of leadership that was given to this province by Viola Desmond. And this government, this government should be standing up on their feet today, making sure that this bill passes so that indeed the family of Viola Desmond can walk away from this house, from walk away from this area and say, we were treated right. My sister was treated right. Our heritage has been treated right. Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I would move second reading of Bill Number 15. The Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the first time 
since I've been in this house, I'm, uh, I must say, I'm, uh, if you notice a little quiver in my voice, it's with emotion. This has been a very emotional day, I'd say probably for all of us. Uh, certainly as the minister responsible of African Nova Scotian Affairs and uh, in the Red Room today, um, I personally was uh, almost brought to tears on a couple occasions. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that uh, uh, afterwards when I spoke to uh, some of the brothers and the sisters that were there, uh, I'm sure uh, we shared some very, very special moments as well. Um, I, I've also got to say, uh, with all due respect, I appreciate uh, this bill coming forward. And during the previous speaker's presentation, he made some assertions that certainly weren't accurate. And I've got to say that on a day when we all should be proud, uh, trying to rush a bill through the House without consultation from the black community is not the right thing to do. This does not demonstrate in any way, shape, or form a change in the attitude of this government. But what it does do, Mr. Speaker, it reinforces the determination that we have to do right by a community that's been done wrong far too many times. In the past, People have done things, I think, and I'll give the benefit of the doubt to all persons, they, th they think they have done things in the right vein by doing for the African Nova Scotian community. What I propose and what I hope that we all understand is that we want you to do with and not for. I certainly don't think there was any malice. Uh, certainly, I, I feel that there's no met for disrespect uh, by proposing this bill. I think it uh, would be disrespectful of every member of this House to rush this bill through without having a vehicle, an opportunity for people from the community to have their say. Earlier today, earlier today, on the advice of the Executive Council, the Lieutenant Governor exercised the royal prerogative of mercy to grant a free pardon to Viola Desmond. It was a great afternoon, which maybe now we can salvage something out of that afternoon. A free pardon is based on innocence and recognizes that the conviction was an error. A free pardon is an extraordinary remedy and is considered only in the rarest of circumstances. This is the first time a free pardon has been granted in Canada after a person's been deceased. Traveling on her way to Sydney, Nova Scotia on November the 8th, 1946, Mrs. Desmond experienced car troubles. She stopped in New Glasgow to have her vehicle serviced, to have it repaired. She decided to pass the time. She had some time to spare and what a Great thing she thought to do, well, I'll go to the movie, and this will occupy some of my time. 
When she awoke that morning, I'm sure that Viola Desmond had little way, had little knowledge of knowing what was in store for her that day. A few hours later, Mrs. Dev Desmond was wrongly jailed and fined for setting in the white-only section of the Roseland Theater in New Glasgow. Throughout recent history, Mrs. Desmond has often been referred to as Canada's Rosa Parks. Mrs. Desmond has become a symbol of defiance and non-compliance, certainly here in the province of Nova Scotia. She stood her ground in the face of discrimination and injustice. At that time, as everybody knows, there was a theater policy for persons of African descent which prohibited them from setting on the main level of the theater. African Nova Scotians were required to set in the balcony where seating was less expensive. You see, what Viola Robson did, and I mentioned earlier today, she violated an unwritten law. A law that stated without words, but that law was etched in the minds and in the attitudes of people that made and enforced those laws. Throughout her entire ordeal, few acknowledged that Mrs. Desmond's arrest was not just simply a matter of refusing to pay the higher price, the higher price for preferred seating, but call it what it was, it was all based on one thing, the pigmentation of her skin. Viola Desmond in 1946 did something that few people have dared to challenge. She challenged the status quo. She refused to stay silent. She dared to ask questions. And she dared to challenge or to accept that all men and all women were not created equal and that fairness should prevail. The story of Viola Desmond should not just be a symbol of hope and pride in the African Nova Scotia community, and I said this earlier, but it should be one that we all, as Nova Scotians, can be proud of. You see, Viola Desmond's story, her story is one of many great stories of perseverance in the African Nova Scotian community. I look across the way, every time this house is in session, I look at the member, the honorable member from Hans West, and he serves as a reminder to me being from Windsor, Nova Scotia, of the accomplishments of my father and so many other African Nova Scotians. There are so many told and untold stories of many brave men and women who stood tall, strong and proud in the face of adversity and who continued to press on. This past African Heritage Month, we had the opportunity to honor six women from across the province who were unsung community matriarchs. Edith Cromwell, Ada Fells, Geraldine White, Burl Brathwaite, May Shepherd, Wilnina Jones made many great and significant contributions to the success of their communities and of its members. And as a result of those individuals, and there's so many of them, 
We all are better people today. We are proud to call them our leading ladies who indeed left lasting legacies. Mr. Speaker, they are just a small example of the many great men and women of African descent who have dedicated their lives to doing great work in and for the province of Nova Scotia. I would like to reiterate, I want to thank the honorable member for bringing this bill forward. And I will certainly take it under advisement and under consideration. But I believe, I truly believe that this bill will require consultation from the community before moving forward. And law amendments, at the very least, will provide only but one vehicle for that to happen. Mr. Speaker, when I heard uh, Bill 15 was coming forward, I started to write about so many people that have made contributions. And I, I, I covered a page. And there are so many others. I thought of the, the Jones family, a very well-known family in the province of Nova Scotia that, that worked tirelessly, father, son, mother, brothers and sisters. I think about the Paris family in New Glasgow, Henderson in particular. I think about the Hamilton family. I think about the Day family, certainly a familiar name with this house. I think of the Oliver family. I think of Tony Johnson. I think of Brad Barton. I think of Cecil Wright. I think of Wanda Thomas Bernard. I think of Edith Cornwell. I think of Lauren White. I think of James Robinson Johnson. I think of Carrie Bess. Can't forget Richard Preston. Without him, we might not have an AUBA. Portia White. Corinne Sparks. Doreen Lewis. George Elliott Clark. William Hall. I could stand here, Mr. Speaker, for the rest of the afternoon and recite names to you, but I'm sure all members of the House get the picture. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to say in closing, I thank the member I thank the party for bringing this bill forward. No doubt about that. But, and this is the but, Mr. Speaker, the African Nova Scotian community deserves to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. I'll now recognize the Honourable Member from Preston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is indeed a wonderful day for Nova Scotians today. Uh, Viola Desmond is truly, has truly been recognized today, and indeed a wrong has been corrected. And I want to congratulate the government for doing that. I think it's long overdue. It's too bad that it couldn't have happened during her lifetime, so she could have seen the significant contribution she has made to our province. And indeed, as the minister has just indicated, it's, it's, there's a lot of things that happen in our community, especially in my community in, in the Prestons. And, and, and even today, there's difficulties that we see that 
most people aren't aware of. And it's unfortunate that today, even to today's society, we don't see the wonderful th contribution that a lot of the people from the black community have made. And when I look at the community, and, and I can tell you by, by representing the community, my life has truly been enriched. I've met a, a people, some people I've known almost my whole life, but in more detail now is MLA, and the hospitality in the community is incredible, and the accomplishments that people have made in the, in the community are incredible. A few of the people's names are listed by the minister, and that's only a very short list. You see the things that, uh, that we've seen in my area, I'll give you an example, the East Preston daycare. When the daycare was started, there was a real problem in the province, and that goes, only goes back to the, uh, into the 70s, into the 70s, not back to 1946, but in the 70s, where children in the black community weren't allowed to get an education. So the community said, we're not gonna tolerate this. And they took the, uh, put a class action suit together to challenge the province and the school board. They won that, that case without ever having to go to court. And to this day, some of those, those recommendations haven't been put in place. But the point was, they started this on incredible daycare center that's won national, international awards for the work they've done. And first of all, the Department of Education will come to the community and say, well, your children aren't educated enough or they, they can't go to school. And that actually happened in the 70s in this province. And then after the daycare got going, they started sending the children off to primary the school board come back to them again and said, you're teaching them too well. And indeed now that the, the children are beyond the expectations of a primary student and well beyond that again. That says a lot for the community. The community has done a tremendous amount. And I want, I want to state that the community has did this. They did it out of necessity. That shouldn't have had to been there. It should have been the fact that they were accepted and racism does, wouldn't have to exist in our province, and it does exist in our province today, very unfortunately. And it does hurt, our, it hurts us, it hurts our families, it hurts the whole province when that happens. And I'm very pleased to, that this bill has come forward today, Bill Number 15, Viola Desmond Day Act. And as this moves forward through the process, I'm sure it will be improved, if, if that's possible. But one thing we should, we should really look at for this day is we should be ensure that our children in the schools in the province, in all the province, not just in, in, in areas like my community, are educated about the absolute necessity to eliminate racism in our province. And as I say, it still does exist. I deal with people in my community on a regular basis that have things happen to them that definitely shouldn't have happened. And we work with them to resolve those problems the best we can. Sometimes we're very successful and sometimes we're not. But always we make some progress to ensure that that hopefully never happens to anyone again. So I think it would be a wonderful day if November the 8th is set aside to make sure that all the schools teach the children why, how, why it's so important to eliminate racism and, and respect each other's cultures. Because after all, this province is made up of many, many cultures, and that makes us very strong and indeed one of the most wonderful places you can possibly live in the province. I think that. We should also expand the day to include public workshops, maybe a speaker system on, on a series on racism, to truly educate the people in our province how important this is and how significant the contributions of the black community have been to our province. And you see, you go and talk to the elders in the community, the people that really make things happen and see over the years how they've changed the attitudes of people outside their community. And I think it's very positive. The sad part is they shouldn't have had to do that. They should have been accepted for the fine people they are and the fine work they have done in our community. And the, the work that the province did today, and I'm pleased to say May Ann Francis um, signed that today, the pardon, and really recognized the plight and the struggle that the black community has had over the years. This is a step forward. We need to make many more steps. And with, the, with those few words, we're in full support of this bill and look forward to moving yeah, it forward as quickly as possible to ensure that uh, this day is not only a day of a pardon and recognition of a fantastic uh, Nova Scotian, but also to ensure that we eliminate the need 
for these things to happen in the future. Hopefully one day we'll be recognized as one people instead of different people and people recognize that for the importance of contribution that people make and the wonderful work they do in the community and indeed the wonderful community that they are. And again, it's my true pleasure to work in the community of Preston and deal with the people and it has truly enriched my life. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Uh, the Honourable Member for Cape Breton North. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased. In fact, I'm very honoured to be able to stand and speak to this bill as presented, Bill 15, to the House. And uh, before I start uh, in my comments, I do want to thank uh, the government, uh, the Executive Council, the Minister of Economic and Rural Development and responsible for African Nova Scotian Affairs, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. I think because what they've recognized today truly does go down the history books of this province, but not only that, indeed our country. And we should never lose sight of that, even in our enthusiasm to want to recognize this, that the government did the right thing, and it was a very good thing for us as Nova Scotians to be able to say that we were part of this history, and part of positive history in this province, and hopefully setting a new pace and tone with regards to uh, race relations and how people are treated. Because we do know, and I've known, Mr. Speaker, and I, and I believe the Minister has referred to this, in the history of this province, you know, there was written laws of the day, written policies with regards to where black or whites could sit. Uh, and then again, in this society of today, while they may not be on paper, we know that the policies still stand with regards to racism and prejudice in this province. And that is something that all of us, I believe, today